So primarily, hypercalcemia results due to either an increased bone mobilization of calcium or decreased urinary calcium loss. Now, I've put the increased intestinal calcium resorption as in a smaller font there because it, it does have variable contribution. And it is mainly the other two that result in the, the pathogenesis um, of the hypercalcemia. But obviously, if you get vitamin D toxicity, then that sort of that source is obviously a much greater contributor. So hypercalcemia, by definition, though total calcium is usually increased, total calcium is an insensitive method, as indicated before, due to the fact that the ionized calcium is the, fact, is the part that we're looking at, and that's the active part. So by definition, if you get a high total calcium, you should really confirm it with ionized calcium. So hypercalcemia, high um, ionized calcium, and with the state of hypercalcemia, what what should happen is you get decreased PTH or parathyroid um, secretion from the parathyroid gland and you get decreased calcitriol or vitamin D production or activation, I should say, from the kidneys. And therefore, it should result in an increased urinary calcium excretion and also decreased mobilization of calcium from the bone. So the diagram here, I don't know if you can, yeah, can see the top bit. So this is just to show the, the negative feedback. In the, in the normal animal that has a functioning parathyroid gland, the, the parathyroid um, is negatively, feed, there's a negative feedback effect of it by calcium and phosphorus. So if you increase calcium and phosphorus, this has a negative feedback on the parathyroid gland and therefore a decreased production of parathyroid hormone. The Calcium and phosphorus also has a negative feedback on the kidneys and the activation to the active form of vitamin D3. And there it just shows vitamin D3 having an effect on the, has an effect on the bone and the intestines, as well as the um, kidney. So just to go through a bit about vitamin D, I was, I was looking in this and I, looking at this and I thought, oh, vitamin D, yeah, vitamin D3. There's just, you know, vitamin D, but vitamin D is a group of compounds and there's not just vitamin D3. The two most important ones, well, vitamin D3 is the most important. And then the next important is vitamin D2. And these two are important with respect to possible pathogenesis of hypercalcemia in our animals. Now, unlike humans, dogs and cats have a limited or no ability to synthesize vitamin D in the skin. And they're sort of quite the similar to us in our country where we get sun not a lot of the time uh, and therefore require vitamin D from another source, usually orally. So the two main sources of vitamin D uh, are D2 and D3, so cholecalciferol, which is vitamin D3. This is found mainly in animal products. And then we've got ergocalciferol, vitamin D2, which is usually of plant origin. Now, Cats and dogs have different diets, and therefore dogs, which are omnivores, can deal with both of these vitamin Ds. So if they consume both of these, they can metabolize and activate both of them. The cats, unfortunately, are carnivores, and therefore they can only utilize vitamin D3. So if for some reason you were supplementing a cat for whatever reason, though it's usually, it's probably unusual with vitamin D3, Two, it probably would have minimal effect on the actual calcium levels. The, both those two um, part, vitamin D2 and D3, sorry, they are converted in the liver to this non-active form of D3, which we can actually measure, um, which is called calcidiol, another name for vitamin, another different name to list. So I think we just call it active and inactive D3. 